without further ado, uh, let's hear it. Welcome Jody Benson to the stage. Horrible, horrible, 
bad knee, such a bad thing to do. So I'm looking at her and I'm washing my hands and I'm like, well, you know what, Kylie? I am. And I think she was about to faint or <laughs> throw up. I can't really tell if she was gonna throw up or faint. So I like reached over to her and she's like hyperventilating. <laughs> And like just breathe because you're about to pass out. So I grabbed her and I'm like, we're getting a picture. We're not taking a picture in the bathroom toilet. We're not doing that. That's going to go viral and you and I are never going to be able to like walk outside of this toilet again. So we ran outside the bathroom. We took our masks off. We just took a selfie out here together. And then I got to share with her, she's a Disney cast member, she's a college program, she just graduated from college, Webster University, and in St. Louis, go Webster. But I told her, I said, you know what, sweetheart, at my age of 13 and 14, my first job was, I was a janitor. I was a janitor at a construction office that my stepdad ran. So I said, you can imagine cleaning the toilet of construction workers. Sorry, don't mean to offend anybody. But that was my job. And her eyes just sat, and I said, what's your dream? She said, I'm actually an animator. I said, are you good? And she's like, well, no, no. I said, I need you to be honest with me. Are you good? She goes, yeah, I'm really good. I said, sweetheart, hold on to that dream. You made me like cry because I was like talking to this girl who is cleaning the restrooms here, and we just had the best time together. So Kylie, wherever you are, I just send you my love. She's out there. She's working. She's working. Anyways, I just had to tell you this story. This is your little applause for Kylie. You know, just have that opportunity to say to her, like, I used to clean toilets. I, I, I'm doing what you're doing right now. And you need to hold on to your dream. And if you're good and you have talent and you have wonderful things, God has an amazing journey for you. And it's not by chance that we met in the bathroom today. So it was really fun. I just had to share that with you. I think that's a perfect lead into my first question. It's going to be tell me about your life before Ariel. What was your life? I had the choice I was 13 and 14. Um, you know, life before Ariel, that's really hard to even imagine, isn't it? It's been, I'm so old, and it's been so long, um, and I, I just, oh my goodness. You know, growing up as a kid in Rockford, Illinois, I had never seen a Broadway show. I wanted to be a Broadway actress when I was eight years old. I don't know why, because I never even seen a show. I didn't even know what it was, but that's what I wanted to do. And I uh, just started singing, and around the house, didn't really have any lessons or training or anything like that, really until I got to college. Um, but I got to do a few shows in high school, which was a really fun experience. We didn't have a choir or anything like that, which we did. But then it was really the, the, the key happened to unlock my heart when I was in college. And I only went for like a year and a half before I started working professionally and, and met my husband. Where's my husband? Where's, where's my husband? Are you in the back row? Really? Really in the last row. Hi. Everybody say hi, Wayne. Hi, Wayne. Wait, like you don't want, you didn't want to be sitting any closer to me, or? We well, can bring another chair. Do you, what? <laughs> you are very socially distant from me, honey. <laughs> How many years have you been married? Okay, I don't, the reason why I asked him is because I don't know. <laughs> no, no, I don't. And every time I'm on stage, if somebody asks me that question, I'm like, oh, please don't ask me that question. Please don't ask me that question. And if I say the wrong answer, guess who shouts out the right one from the audience? But now you're all in the back rows, you're going to have to stand up and like, use your big boy voice. 37 and a half, yes, the man of my dreams. He's my friend. He's amazing. Yeah. So um, let me just tell you, he's I'm just like talking. I'm talking so much right now. I'm sorry. Let me tell you, um, he's a walking miracle. He just had quintuple open heart bypass surgery on Valentine's Day 2020, and he rides 50 miles a day on his road bike, 5,000 miles a year, no symptoms whatsoever, and they just found it in a regular checkup. Is that a miracle or what? So I'm happy to allow. 
Um, so, then leading up, one, one follow, more follow-up question to that. Um, You're going to try to stay in the program. You know I talk screen. Oh, I know. I'm not You know, uh, you I'm just got to go and you get, because really when, you, when I get up here, my mind just, ooh, I'll just start okay. talking about anybody. Sorry about that. No, not at all. <laughs> um, so you, before Little Mermaid, you did work with Howard Ashman. Yes. And there's a song that yes. uh, a Disney fans will love that you sang in that show. Yes. Uh, can you tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, Howard Ashman, an absolute brilliant genius, and I'm so blessed that I got to do not one, but two projects with him. So he was my director for Smile, which was an ill-fated Broadway musical. One person saw it, yeah. Uh, Howard Ashton and Marvin Hamlish, and they wrote for my character the song Disneyland. A uh, beautiful song, which I've sung here in this ballroom before. A um, beautiful song, an I want song from this character, Doria. She wanted to live at Disneyland. It was, it's such a beautiful song. And on opening night of our Broadway show, uh, I got up on stage at Studio 54, which is where our opening night party was back in the day. It was 86, November 86. And um, they brought me up on stage, closed your eyes, I opened my eyes, and there was Mickey Mouse. So Mickey Mouse came and gave me the keys to the kingdom. So I am an honorary citizen, I, I'm an honorary live-in citizen of um, Disneyland. Isn't that crazy? And then the show closed, and how it felt so bad that we all lost our jobs, that he allowed a few of us to audition for Little Mermaid. And of course, I'd never been behind the microphone before, I didn't know what I was doing. So I thought, never in a million years am I gonna get it. You know, it's crazy. And a year later, I get the call that I, I'm Ariel. And I was like, what's an Ariel? I mean, I had totally forgotten about the audition. And I really thought that Howard had a lot to do with it, but he said he didn't. It was really all the powers that he, at Disney, and our directors, Ron and John, that listened to the tapes, made the selection, and Glenn Keane started animating, and Mark Henn, and, you know, and here we are, that we're sitting here all these years later talking about it with all of you. It blows my mind. Like, if you asked me back in 1985 when I started as a Disney cast member, are you going to be talking about this in the year 2021? I'd be like, no. No. We're never going to be talking about this again. Do you want to talk to us about the movie making process and how you recorded and all that? Yeah, let me ask you guys this, uh, ladies and gents, this question. So, how many of you think that we do the animation first? Raise your hands. The animation first, and all the this. Okay. How many people think it's the voice first? There you go. You are all well trained Disney fans. Yes, it's the voice first. So I went into the recording studio about two and a half weeks over the course of two and a half years. So I probably had 15, 16 days in the studio over the course of two and a half years. So remember, Mermaid is super special because we are the last hand-painted, hand-drawn, full-length animation feature film for the studio, right? So when you think about all those bubbles, those are hand-drawn by amazing artists, and it makes our film really, really special, you know, that we get to kind of hold on to that legacy. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been an incredible journey. I have a question that I asked um, another princess here earlier, and I was wondering at the time, um, there was like a whole girl power movement, and did you realize like this from character of Ariel and how that would play into that the time for girls? Yeah, because our last Disney princess before my character is Aurora. No, yes, Sleepy Beauty, Sleepy Beauty. And so you can see the jump from Aurora to Ariel. And it was a big jump, and it was really risky at the time too. And I had no idea what was riding on our film. But obviously, the fate of the Disney feature animation department was riding on this film. You know, at that point, we had moved off a lot uh, over into Flower Street, into the trailer systems over there, and um, things were really rocky. You know, we just really didn't know what was going to happen. So I had no idea the pressure that was on this film to make this transition into what we now know as the second golden age of animation. So. It was just it, just an unbelievable ride from and, and journey from the first day of doing a read through like a Broadway musical. And we were all sitting around the piano 
you know, out of the theater and got Howard, and they're singing the songs to us, and we're singing them back to him, because all that I needed to do was copy and imitate Howard. That's what I did. I imitated Howard. So he played all the characters. And what we did is we were smart, and we just followed what Howard did. <laughs> he made our job really easy. But as a genius like he was, like Ron and John, my directors, were so gracious and so kind, and stepped away from their pride or ego, which neither of them had uh, at all. I mean, they were they're genuine men, just so kind. They stepped aside and let Howard stand in the studio right next to me. And he was silent. You couldn't hear him. But every single line, every lyric of everything in The Little Mermaid, Howard's standing next to me. It was, it was, it's, it's such a perfect memory for me. And it really pays tribute. So, you know, anytime that I'm talking about mermaid, and same for Alan, it's all Howard. You know, he is the one that brought Alan on the project. I mean, that was his partner. So it's like, I was like, you, you get me, you get Alan too. So they really didn't need to think about looking at another composer because they were such a dynamic team. Um, in the process of making the film, because it takes years, and did, uh, how, about how long from your first recording session till the final one was that? Process. Well, the whole film was two and a half years, and so I started the first week, and I probably had five or six days in the studio to lay everything down. Then I went back maybe six months later for some basic rewrites when it would have just been, you know, pencil sketches at that time. And then, once the film was animated, I went back in for another couple, three days before the final release, and that would be considered ADR, which is additional dialogue reporting, which is basically lip syncing to myself, matching to the picture. And that would be where, let's say we didn't get the right interpretation of a line, and we didn't have it saved up from two and a half years ago, then I would go back in and lay down new interpretations of those lines. But this time, I would be watching the screen and breathing and matching to the mouth. So, it doesn't sound like too much changed in that time, because you only went in for very minimal... No, yeah, I mean, Howard and Alan's score was so solid and so perfect, we did not change anything on the song. In fact, um, really, some, I would say, for the most part, part of your world is a one pass, meaning it's, it's a whole performance. We may have, they may have punched in a couple of things from something else, but it was really important for Howard, and it was really important for me, it's a monologue that happens to be put to pitch. And the only way to interpret that monologue is to do it in real time, all the way through. And, and that's a, that, again, that's a theater quality, that's a Broadway thing. And it, the other thing about it is that it's not perfect. It's not a perfect pass. I have some notes that are, are flat. Uh, there are some breathy notes, there are some rhythm changes. It is not a perfect pass, but it's a perfect pass for Ariel in the reality for you to be able to believe what she was going through at that moment. It's, it's real. It's not it's real. over That's exactly produced. right. Yeah. It is not overproduced. It's definitely, and that was really important to Howard, um, especially, for part of your world to be as authentic and as vulnerable and to not be like a recorded song that was pieced together perfectly, you know, or auto-tuned. So it, it needed to be real. The irony is, it was perfect to me. <laughs> well, it was perfect for Ariel's story, you know. But for, for me as a vocalist, sometimes it's hard for me to listen back to it because, you know, I'll, I'll be going, ooh, ee, ah, a little bit pitchy, you know, or something like that, I'm kind of judging it. But that's why I can go in the booth. I'm like, no, no, no. You've got Howard in the booth. He's a thousand times more of a perfectionist than I ever will be. I do not need to worry. So then, do you want to come in and 
let's do some past slow and go, you got Howard, you're good. Because I'll make you crazy. I'll go back and do it like a hundred more times. Um, but we didn't do the song that many times. You know, people would think, oh, did you make like 50 passes or, you know, 75 times? And be like, uh, no. But, <laughs> you know, I mean, we, we may have done a good seven, you know, here or there, maybe 10 at the most. And then maybe pieced a few little things together. But. And since then, you guys come in. <laughs> Every day, um, three times a week, four times a week since 1986, 86? I think my hair date is 86, maybe it's in studio 87. So you do the math. Yeah. <laughs> you do the math. I wanted to invite everyone to take out your recording device if you would like to, because I wanted to ask you if there are, also, if you have questions, we're going to take questions. Um, yeah, we're doing questions. That's right, we're doing questions. Yeah, in just a couple minutes, we're going to hand it over to you guys. Uh, there's mics over here on either side, so get those questions to me. So maybe you're up with us. I wanted to ask if there are any lines that are very stiff out to you that people ask you to say and are just delighted to hear. Um, yeah, I think the lead in, and there's a couple different varieties of the lead in part of your world, but um, maybe he's right. Maybe there is something in that earthy. I just don't see how a world that makes such wonderful things could be bad. So that's always, I think that's such a beautiful culmination of what Ariel's going through at that moment in time. And the other line, did I make you cry? Oh, I'm sorry. I could hear something. <laughs> I didn't mean to make you talk. Um, the other line, it, it's funny, but the line that was so difficult for me to record, and then I had to come back and do it before the movie came out, was, um, I love you, Daddy. It was impossible for me to do that line. And I realized, oh, I get true when I think about it, but my dad left when I was 11, and I did not have a relationship with him, you know? Even until the day he died, I was with him when he died, and it just, you know, due to his mental illness and all sorts of issues, I just, I didn't have my dad at my wedding. I didn't have a daddy-daughter dance. I went with other people's dads to those types of things. And on my wedding day, I didn't have that father-bride dance, you know? And so when it came time, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm going to say this line. And I couldn't do it in the studio. And Howard was like, are you OK? I'm like, I don't, I'm, I can't do it. I just don't think I can do this. I can't get through this line without crying. He's like, that's OK. Just take that emotion. Um, and let's just walk through this together, you know? And so that, you think that those precious couple little words would have been no big deal. But for some reason, I just couldn't do it. So we had to come back towards the end of the film and do it again. Um, and it's just, you know, just one of those things that's always precious when I see the movie and I think about that at the end. And, you know, I get like, you're supposed to relate to your character in all these different ways. And I couldn't relate to Ariel in that moment. You know, like hugging your daddy and having that. But Howard was like, there's ways that you can have that, you know, without having your dad here. Like, if you could have that moment, what would it look like? And I thought, oh, that, that's a great way to look at it. I need to, like, change the script. I need to flip the switch on, on the way I was feeling. So, yeah, so those are probably two, you know, really sweet lines. And I was like, um, <laughs> oh, Flounder, don't be such a dummy. I, I think that's just the funniest line. And of course, I had to do that one like 50 times because I just thought it was so funny. You know, I'd be like, let's just do it again. Let's just do it again. You know? <laughs> oh, flounder, don't be such a guppy. Oh, flounder, don't be such a guppy. Flounder, don't be such a guppy. And so I'd be like, think in different ways. And I'd be like, they push the button, like, Jody, I think we have that. <laughs> Jody, we have that line. I'm like, I know, but I like it. And so I'd do it again. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing that those very heartfelt, very meaningful stories.